That was sweet. Thanks, Plan B. That was sweet. Thursday. Wayne Kernikan was stuck at home during an excruciatingly long winter. He was what his parents believed to was be his a name problem Wien? child, experiencing nightmares, arguing with his seven siblings, and getting in trouble at school. His parents' method of punishment wasn't the best. Having gone on record to state that his father beats him with hockey sticks, it was undeniable that their humble abode in Damn. suburban Connecticut was less of a place of refuge for him and more of a cell of torment. Thanks the the phone rings snake. in the kitchen, and his mom answers. It's from a school up north called Alon. The man on the phone says that Wayne should come right away, and that they'll have a private jet waiting for him at Danbury Airport. What a good deal! His mom tells him not to worry, wow. and that it's more of an outdoor camp type thing that'll make him better. According to the flyer she read, it was proven with a 95% success rate, and their alumni were all leaving as better people than when they first arrived there. Counselors, psychiatrists, activities, friends, Alon had it all, he was told. And so Wayne packed up his stuff that night. Eager, sure. Nervous, yes. But absolutely awaiting the things to come. Is the resub Chuba? The plane touches down in Portland, Maine. Two men greet him. After embarking for the school 30 minutes north in Poland, his escorts inquire on why he was sent there. Who made this vid? It's an expo. Drugs? Nope. Court order? No. So why the hell are you going? They joke. And then things get quiet. I keep seeing this one's fucked up. Wayne began to question whether he Why? was going to the place he thought he was. Cults are known to be Something pretty cool. Didn't seem right, but he was willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. Thanks the prime soap, and the resub prime the two key. pull off a back wooded road into a clearing. Looks like a camp, he thinks. However, when he exits the vehicle, he isn't greeted with the silent serenity of nature, but instead, the screaming. Yeah, but that could mean anything. I scream when I'm having a lot of fun. Like, yeehaw, we're having fun. Yeah, I saw the American Horror Story cult season. American Horror Story is the best shitty show. The 1970s were an interesting time. Across the United States, a rise in for-profit behavior modification facilities were in action. Now called the troubled teen or tough love industry, it seemed to be a money machine aimed at altering and stifling troublesome behavior in adolescents. Well, the someone's got to. hard to gauge due to the widely varying nature of the names, motives, and specialties of each of these schools, but they were widespread and only became more so throughout the 80s. It's widely believed that the parental reception to the era's youth were the catalyst for facilities like this. Given that this was the decade following the rise of the hippie subculture, authority was and had been challenged Whoa! for years. That facial hair is kind of nutty. That looks cool. It's like Wolverine, but not cool like Wolverine's. It's like a little cushion. That's nice. That's like an OG neck beard. Resulting in a sort of panic among older generations. Resultingly, in early 1970, a psychiatrist named Gerald Davidson, Finca. alongside investor David Goldberg and a man named Joseph Ritchie, would band together to create a school named Alon, a private co-ed behavior modification program geared from grade 8 to beyond high school. <clears throat> 
Richie built the facility as one that would correct bad behavior by teens without punishment, while painting himself as a genuine mentor that could help make that happen. They had a website? 33 acres of land off of Number 5 Road in Poland, Maine, Alon's main campus was highly secluded and a long shot from any outside civilization. With numerous facilities in place, the school was well equipped to handle a student body in the hundreds, and within the span of just one year, they'd eventually meet that metric. <clears throat> numerous alumni, much like Wayne, have gone on record to state that their initial, outside impression of the school was that it was like a summer camp in the Maine woods. However, it looks like a level, summer camp. Reality would paint a different picture. Allegedly, the final minutes of the trip there were unforgettable, with Alon being Thank shrouded you, sir. down a long dirt Jibu road honey. in the middle of the wilderness, and made up of rundown trailers and buildings, giving it a frightening feeling of dread. Furthermore, some have stated it does look that like Crystal Lake. The vehicle, expecting a lively campground, they're instead faced with a sight much stranger. Some students were spotted wearing degrading signs. Some shackled in handcuffs. What? Some being yelled at. And bizarrely, everyone would just pretend it's normal. At this point, they it's take discipline that very seriously. Attempt to flee. They weren't entirely sure what the Elan school was, but it was clear to them that it wasn't good. These escape efforts were always futile, though as Alon stationed guards around the campus to chase and subdue outliers that would attempt this. Considering how the school was marketed, touting itself as an altruistic institution, genuinely concerned with helping troubled teenagers get better, it was clear from the outside that those claims were a reach. Is that Charles Manson teaching the class? But Man, they got celebrities, they teachers. Good for them. What most students were unaware of was that behind their back, a deal was made on their behalf. With nothing but a simple signature and in payment, parents could sign their child's life over to Elan, which advertised itself as a positive, reaffirming center of growth. According to an excerpt from an early 2000s archive of their website, we can observe the vernacular so this is pretty recent. To, to each parent. Dear parents, are very aware of how lonely and confused you must feel as you sit down to read this. If you're like the parents of most of our students, you're faced with an adolescent whose behavior is out of control and you don't know why. A youngster who's been given everything and is throwing it all away is difficult to understand, but you can see that this process is progressive. The most saddening part is knowing that your offspring is ruining his or her future. Mm. Your own pain is difficult, but your pain for your child is unbearable. Yeah, they're not reaching their but full potential. Lot, you have come to a truly different school. We can't offer you miracles, but we can offer you hope. We know that your journey to this point has been painful. We hope Elan can change its course. On top of this, school staff were known to hand out flyers to parents while persuading them that their child just might be troubled. It's been noted that Joseph Ritchie was somewhat of a salesman. He was charismatic and excelled at convincing parents of all the good that Elan could do for their kids. The good that, as we'll soon find, was all a lie. I'd like to let it be known that Wayne's Elan admission story was on the lighter side. For most of the other students, things were handled a bit more violently. Instead of a plane, school alumni have gone on record to state that they were transported by van. Reportedly, once your parents agreed to send you off to Elan and pay the $50,000 tuition fee, they designated time and date with Elan's so-called teen escort service. They wow. wouldn't pick you up during the day, though. Instead, in the middle of the night when you're fast Why, asleep, though? they would bust through your door and <laughs> kidnap you. Why? In years past, Alon's staff have stated that since the child has no say in attending, their capture hinges on the element of surprise. Okay. According to a blog named Suzuki's Thoughts, the abduction process involves two So are these just the stories bedroom, what? Physically subduing them. Are these just stories this guy makes up? What? No, what? Is all you read creepy pastas? Why why would he make up a 52-minute story and make websites to corroborate it and and evidence and stuff? 
It's just like a history lesson that's well presented. Tying them up with plastic handcuffs, throwing them into a van, and then driving them to Poland, Maine, where they'd be handed over to the Elan School. Such experiences often traumatize the teens who were abducted. For all they knew at first, they were being taken by criminals to be held ransom, tortured, or worse, killed. For the girls, it was even more terrifying. Some girls later recalled that they believed that they were going to be raped and murdered by Exit their abductors. Tier one, kindy. one certainly can't blame the kids for thinking this way. Such practices had all the hallmarks of a violent kidnapping. This practice became notorious around the United States, eventually earning its nickname, the Elan Snatch. If this so this was so well known that it, it had its own name? Morality wasn't the school's strong suit. But that ultimately begs the question, would it stop there? Or was their torment only just beginning? Thanks, Theresa Bzilizi. The 70s, man? What are you talking about? This was in 2000. They have a fucking website. Had a website. Day one. Students would typically arrive to Elan during the early morning hours of the day. Oh, it started in the, the 70s. Oh, campus, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I see what you're saying. To resist their escorts. I see what you're saying. It's Sorry. It's noted that their capture was designed this way, utilizing their escape attempt against them as a tool to convey that no matter what, they're not getting out of there. And with this came the first steps of dehumanization, instilling the feeling that their basic rights have been robbed of them, in turn making them feel like less of a student Thanks, and more like a prisoner. Well, they did just get kidnapped. This sentiment was taken even further when they're physically taken inside the school. Often, the first stop would be the dormitory showers, which served as a tool in robbing each student of their sense of individuality. Reportedly, Students are thrown into them with absolutely no privacy and are demanded to remove all of their clothing and valuable items. After complying, they're given what Elan calls no-image clothing, which, as the name implies, simply includes a bland, colorless shirt and pants, effectively forcing them into a state of conformity. Well, let's not get carried away. The, a white t-shirt's pretty each cool. Each student would be taken into a common area where there is I, I wouldn't Elan necessarily look too deep brother. into that. This, in essence, was a tenured student designated to be a guide. On paper, they were told to help their students adjust to their new life on campus, somewhat like a peer, while educating them on how great and effective the program is. In reality, though, this relationship was far from friendly. It's been reported that big brothers would often try to deceive their newer counterparts, enticing them to run away or to break the rules. If the student had ever agreed or attempted to listen to this, their behavior would be reported to school staff, resulting in punishment. As we've seen in studies like the Stanford Prison Experiment, I'm sure you can see why this wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't know that experiment. Oftentimes, big brother figures, much like staff, would take great pleasure in exerting their superiority over the newer students. It fulfilled them in a way that was almost cult-like. Yes, you do. I don't know that one. Hey, well, thank you for that, Stove. I heard about the Alan Wake announcement. I'm excited. <laughs> Looks like the house from Promised Neverland. like a baby you get screamed at if you want to act as more like a mature adolescent you get talked to oh so i was like I, wait speaking what speaking of cults was that footage from uh elon universe is it is it elon or elan i don't know how to say it either way but didn't he just say that they were forced to wear like the colorless shirts Thanks to the resub, Jeski, Coral, Pablo, and Prime Bus. Because that guy, like, that second guy, he's kind of dripped out. He's got a chain on. 
He's got a red button up. Oh, that was staff. Gotcha. The social hierarchy at Elan is structured in a way that heavily resembles one. At the school, students like are immediately Snape. placed into two categories. Strengths, which were tenured, obedient students that were a few steps up the totem pole, and non-strengths, the newer ones who typically resisted treatments. Strengths were allowed to talk to fellow strengths and non-strengths. Non-strengths, on the other hand, were only permitted to communicate with strengths. If a non-strength were caught communicating with a non-strength, harsh punishment would soon greet them. Thanks the resub mob. And the 2k bit Sam, I appreciate that. The Elan school, as we've established, thrives on the feeling of hopelessness. Throughout students' tenures there, they were forbidden <clears throat> to contact anyone from the outside world <clears throat> unless they've earned the privilege through good behavior and compliance. Every single phone line <clears throat> on campus would run through a single switchboard located in this small trailer and it was heavily guarded because of that. If a student were to gain the privilege of contacting their family, it's been reported that they're heavily monitored, only permitted to praise the school for all the good it's done to help them during their time there. If they ever were to be caught telling the truth or revealing the atrocities that occur behind the scenes, they were quickly disconnected, reprimanded, and robbed of any future potential. So if this is supposed to be a scam, again. I feel like this is a lot more effort than just not on top of the phone manipulation, doing this. Every Elan resident was It seems like so much more work to abuse the kids. Letter, which, as you might expect, is an explanation of how great the Elan school is for them, all the great activities they do there, and how well they're progressing through the program. These letters would be heavily scrutinized before being mailed out to their parents. Effectively, this tactic's goal was twofold. To allow Elan's facade to remain in place, Thank you, sub -hoof, and to entice Chris, their parents to spend more money on their treatment, one Aria. in turn keeping them there Thank even you, longer than they had ever planned Thank to. You, in reality, students were helpless, being abused, and in most yeah, cases, I get that it's a cult. Verbally, but usually cults have a purpose. The Elan school staff. It was clear to students that they weren't getting away from this anytime soon, and after realizing this. Their minds would often pivot away from rebellion and towards compliance in hopes of power. Yeah, money. I, uh, that's why I would think this they'd want to run a scam to as opposed to a cult. And it'd be so much easier to ultimately stuck not the abuse the kids. Do it takes a lot more work to do that, I imagine. To make their escape. Impossible. So I'm assuming there is a point to the cult, like they want to turn these kids into like super soldiers or something, I don't really know. But if it was just a scam, they're putting a lot of work into it. Whereas they could just take the kids here for 50k a year and As just let them expect, play basketball and sleep. The Elon school were immense. Exerting nearly totalitarian control over everything that happens, Joe Ritchie's set of rules, which he called guilt, was gargantuan and needlessly meticulous. I did tier one, Wilu. As a student at Elan, you would be expected to refrain from doing the following. Having any image, reading as a non-strength, not completing learning experiences, writing without permission, oh. being sideways, oh, looking at means. security zones, non-strength interacting, talking too loudly, talking too softly, looking at the opposite gender, Whoa. being attracted to someone, Whoa. any physical contact, Looking out windows, unauthorized what? drawing, not listening to higher Holy ranks, shit. pretending to sleep at night, thinking of running away, being in the bathroom for too long, wearing dark clothing, being manipulative, being lazy while working, listening to music, talking too much, showering for All in all, they're minutes, pretty lenient. Not talking enough, making facial reactions to orders, negative body language, pretending not to have guilt, oversleeping, undersleeping. Smiling, and the list goes on and on. That's not bad. Clearly, these rules were not designed to be followed. Basically, a lawless place over there. Organizations to become commonplace. To help enforce these, the individuals known and as expediters were designated by the school to stand on watch with clipboards. Primarily, they were known to catch those that broke three rules: being attracted to members Makes of the opposite gender, Uzi. looking at the opposite gender and making prolonged eye contact with anyone else. Since expediters too were required to fill their clipboards with names and infractions at the risk of their own punishment, 
they frequently and unapologetically made assumptions and accusations that were a lie. As you'd expect, punishment varied pretty heavily at Elan, and not in a good way. One example involved requiring a group of students to live in a dumpster for over two weeks. Whoa. The expediter watching them was tasked with ensuring compliance and preventing any attempt to escape. If their subordinates acted out, however, the expediter on duty would be forced to live in the dumpster with them <laughs> while being monitored by yet another who is up to the task. Another wow. major tactic at Elan was humiliation. They figured that by breaking down their social barrier, forcing students into extreme embarrassment, they could drive them to a point of total compliance. Those who tried to escape were often labeled as a split risk, and their punishment for doing so was confiscation of their shoelaces and the requirement to wear a bright yellow t-shirt and short pink shorts. The school figured that without laces, their shoes were effectively useless, what? in turn preventing any ability to move any faster than a walk. What is it a like barbed wire on the ground or something? Risk punishment Just go barefoot. Was shown with this student. Instead of a t-shirt and shorts though, he was forced to wear a bright pink rabbit suit with cuffs around his legs. It's unclear if this is a repeat offender, but it raises the question as to how far Alon would actually go with this tactic. Thanks, the recent hunter. Students that smiled at a place were punished by wearing dunce caps and reduced to work that the school calls shot down. These involved repetitious, dull tasks like mopping floors, scrubbing the insides of trash cans, and even cleaning toilets with just a single toothbrush. For Man, if I went to one of these in, fucking schools, if my parents if sent me here, I would never forgive them. Down. It's been noted that approval by sometimes six or more superiors was required before you were able. And even then, an escort had to watch you while you were in there. This, on top of a myriad of other degrading punishments, like some retribution. humiliating sign and diaper wearing, it's clear that Alon kept an iron grip on their daily operations. Their daily operations that took up most of the daily schedule, and those that were deceptively named by the Alon school themselves as their treatment. Makes it a bit savage. And give some Ethan. But I will say, all of these punishments are relatively tame compared to what we're about to talk about. Let's just say, if you pissed off a staff member, they could start something called a general meeting on you. And trust me, you wouldn't want one. That doesn't sound so intense. What, we're just gonna debate, huh? There seemed to be no standard for them. They would just happen at random, multiple times each day. If staff were annoyed tier one, Joseph or felt like targeting a specific student for some reason, they could call a general meeting at any time. Once these words were uttered, everyone in the building would be required to gather in front of the students in whichever room they were in. Get your feelings off, the administrator screams. And following this, each student in the room would begin screaming at and berating the students, firing off slurs and obscenities. For oh, so it's like room. Twitter. No matter how much Pretty the innovative. Pretty innovative. For everyone to stop, no matter how much they broke down, no matter how much they cried, general meetings would not end until the admin said so. And when it finally did, the victim would lie there often crying and exhausted at the relentless abuse that they'd just endured. <clears throat> it's clear that general meetings aren't designed <clears throat> to reprimand. They're designed to completely break each and every student that's the subject of one. And with this, we can effectively put the points together that Alon was doing nothing more than running an operation that commanded total compliance. Any self-thought or Teddy. sliver of independence that students thought they had True, was gone. They were merely reduced to weapons. Weapons that, at a moment's notice, could just as easily be used against them. Seven PM. Are they also haunted by vampires or something too? Like how much worse can it get? Contrary Fucking werewolves or something? On academia and outside marketing. School time within a lawn was secondhand to the student's treatment. Typically, the time frame for learning was 7 to 11 p.m., but sometimes could run longer. As you might expect, there were no extracurriculars, no physical Basically education, two, one squish no in the projects, zero no legitimate and exams, nothing. 
Instead, students were required to grade themselves the on work grade. that they were self-assigned with absolutely no direction. The structure of class typically involved a staff member supervising a room full of children. Each night of learning involved completing work out of freshman level textbooks, which, unsurprisingly for a group of teenagers, would be immensely uneventful. Given that class time was after a long day full of verbal abuse, monotonous tasks, and a hierarchy system that does nothing but suffocate the lower classes, students dozing off and losing track of their work was expected. Curiously, school time too June was regarded as a privilege savage, and a lie. And I guess, Joe Ritchie and a white has gone on record to state that the class schedule itself was designed this way on purpose. Allegedly, he believes students were easier to control while sleep deprived and utilized even this as a medium to work against them. By 11 p.m., if a student makes it through a night of work without issue, school hours then draw to a close. Not bad. They're quickly released from class and escorted to their dorms, which were often in the form of uncomfortable, impersonal, military style bunk beds. That's military style, a piece of wood. Sleep was known to be difficult, as designated students named night owls were assigned to stand guard with flashlights. In regular intervals, they'd shine them on the sleeping students to both ensure that they hadn't escaped and to secure the fact that they're actually asleep. What? A requirement that, as we can recall, was also in the list of Alon's rules. And if one actually manages to calm their nerves, dozing off into their only time of tranquility, that would allow them to effectively place the cap on a day in the nightmare. That is Alon. Exit Prime, Avanoth, True Toxic, and the 10 gift subs, Nataroni. Thank you, Nataroni. I wanna look something up real quick. I'm curious. Let me see something. I don't want to spoil anything, but I do want to see something. I just want to see if like the main guy behind it's still alive, but I don't want it to be a, a spoiler either. His name was like Joe something and I forgot, so I'm trying to find it. It says, I don't think it's Joe Rogan, but it keeps wanting me to type in Joe Rogan. It was like Joe something. Richie, that's what it was. Thank you. He's dead. Damn. Thanks the Prime Tarkus and the of Paranoid and Cookies and the Tier 1 Matt. And then you get to do it all over again. aspect of Alon, among everything else that happened there, was something called the Ring. Considered the highest level of punishment, Alon's staff could make the call to start the Ring at any time. The structure was set up similar to that of a general <clears throat> meeting, and was typically commenced when school staff believed that the punishment wasn't harsh enough for a specific student. Well, I gave them safety equipment. In the Ring, a student's designated as a bully and is outfitted with a face guard and gloves. Surrounding them are troves of others that are commanded to scream and yell obscenities at them. While this is taking place, specific students will be chosen to compete against the bully in numerous fist fights until school staff decided that they were sufficiently injured. No one was safe from the ring either. Some bore pre-existing injuries, some were much smaller than their opponent, and some were even pregnant. Wait, what? Even worse. Things seem to be treated like a game, with superiors commentating. This is on only up to like high school. TV. In reality, how are the? This was the further. Wait, I'm super curious then. So, how were some of them pregnant? Because you're not even allowed to look at the opposite gender. And assuming that you lived here for a year, how would you get pregnant? That makes no sense to me. I guess if they could have arrived pregnant, 
which would check out. Staff? Oh, by the, I see what you're saying, by the staff. Right, 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 right. Thanks the prime material. I keep forgetting that there's actual adults behind this, because it looks like, it, it sounds like they literally only appoint the students to do everything here. It's like Lord of the Flies. This thing from TV. This was handcrafted abuse. Alon was meticulous about orchestrating fights for the ring, too. It's been noted that certain students would regularly be punished for another's actions, effectively engineering anger between them. This was often noticed between big brothers and their subordinates, as they'd be punished for the actions of their newer counterparts. And once they were angry enough, a ring fight would commence, often injuring one. students so badly Imperial that they'd man. sustain permanent brain damage, PTSD, and even death. It costs $17,400 to send the average youngster to Elan for one year. Even at that price, there are judges, hey, social workers, and parents who consider it a bargain. Elan's defenders claim it has the most consistently effective program for salvaging young people who are too difficult for other facilities to handle. So many states want to use Elan that there's a waiting list. But on the other hand, one state agency in Massachusetts will no longer send their youngsters here because they object to the way the children are treated. One reason is the use of physical punishment. Joe, you make no bones about it. There is hey, corporal punishment here at Elan. Tell us about it. What are the stages it comes in? Who's it administered by? Well, it's, it's administered by the kids, first of all. And corporal, it's a, it's a harsh term, okay? What it is, is we have the ring, okay, which... Uh, <sighs> Oh, he's Everybody super open about it. It's, it's not a boxing ring. It's a ring of human people. The bully is introduced as what he is. In this corner is the bully who's trying to turn this facility into a detention center. Okay? And in this corner is the house champion who's going to show him why it can't be done. And that's exactly how it does. And we never allow the bully to win. Uh, but girls get put in the ring, too. Well, girls bully as well as boys do. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't... It's... Uh, you know, we're, we're a uh, equal rights facility. Uh, oh, that's progressive, okay. Spanking, which is symbolic. Again, it's a last resort. Okay, wow. and, it's, and it's one resident spanking another resident, and it's done with a ping pong paddle, okay? And uh, usually a person won't get spanked more than once or twice. But it's a symbolic thing, which is if you're gonna act like a baby, you should be treated like a baby. On December so he is just super open about it. A 15-year-old Elan student named Philip Williams was placed into the ring. He Is wasn't the largest Rimmy? kid there, but he was the known to do what he could Shadow. to put up a fight. He had grown up in a and family of division, smoker. regularly witnessing his father physically Three abuse his mother. Crimson. With this, there was an anger within him, a sadness that Elan noticed and wanted to exploit. And so, that evening, a ring session commenced with Phil as the bully. There was fight, after fight, after fight. In the end, it's been reported that he was beaten up so badly that he fell flat on the floor, and it took an entire 20 minutes before an ambulance was called to help him. 20 minutes or so they called the ambulance. They took Phil and they never saw him again, his sister claims. I thought it was a wonderful place. I thought they were helping my brother. I thought he was coming home. How, like, how can you think that when they actually yeah, kidnapped right. him? In a box. Like, I don't get that delusion. Alon's Their technique was to kidnap was them. That he had regularly faked headaches. The cause of death? A brain aneurysm. And no charges were ever filed against them. It's been clear to us from the beginning that Alon is not a place of good. From humiliation to beratement, to physical abuse. Alon's tactics were archaic Exit tier one, Ryan, and the resub Connor. For a school that markets itself on academia, on helping students get their lives back on track, it's crystal clear that this has never been the motive. <clears throat> what I find interesting, though, is that Alon wasn't even the first to utilize this type of therapy, this attack therapy. In fact, it has its roots in a cult that found its footing all the way back 
in the mid 1950s. Thanks to Tier One Awesome Pie Man. That cult is one by the name of Synanon. Never heard of it, and I know a lot of cults. County, with a warrant to investigate reports of child abuse. In recent years, Synanon began calling itself a religion. He's 52 years old. He's deaf in one ear. Uh, he's an egomaniac. But one of the wisest persons that I've ever met in my life. He knows how to get people moving. He creates turbulence. Gentlemen, until the prime bone notice, scope. no member of the California Department of Corrections is permitted on Synanon property unless he has the express permission of Charles D. Very Ray, cool spectacles. What is he, a fighter pilot? In early 1958, a man by the name of Charles Dedrick Sr. would found the group in Santa Monica, California. It was intended to be a drug rehabilitation program aimed at delinquents. However, in the years that followed, it appeared to stray from that mission entirely. The distinguishing form of therapy employed by Synanon was something called the game, which in today's terms is more commonly known as attack therapy. The focus of the game was That's to a really break weird down the social construct of an individual's mind by Attack first allowing therapy. them to open up about themselves before commencing an aggressive beratement session, much like we discussed earlier with general meetings. The primary goal was to recreate someone's personality and sense of self by completely demolishing Thanks everything they know about themselves the before Mango. rebuilding them as a newer, subjectively better person. It hinged on the brink of legality while being entirely immoral. And, unsurprisingly, by 1991, the cult would disband due to criminal convictions that caught up to many of their members. The founder also died just six years later, leaving behind a dark legacy that, to this day, is known as one of the most dangerous and violent cults that America has ever seen. That's weird. I've never heard of them. This is, of course, the abridged history. To be honest with you, I could make an entire hour-long video on the operations and practices of Synanon. Oh, they look like they're having fun. For another day. If there's one takeaway tonight, though, it's that an unknown inspiration and blueprint for other institutions to follow. One of those being Alon, and by utilizing similar practices, they appeared to carry the torch that Synanon was forced to abandon. They knew they had to keep up appearances too, thriving off an immaculate public Thank image the spearheaded by the charisma of Joe Ritchie. Joe. Before the age of the internet, admittedly this Man's was Man's built like do. your grandmother. Television documentaries like NBC's For the Child's Own Good were seemingly the only inside look that the public was allowed to gain. However, even they failed to convey the true extent of what happened there. The hush-hush foundation that Alon was built upon initially seemed to be unbreakable. However, due to a rise in public attention that would soon find its way there, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the cracks beneath that very foundation were merely beginning to form. Is it Prime Pink? Why didn't they fight back? Brother kids. What do you mean? Through the late 70s and into the early 80s, reports of the true nature of Elan began to spread by word of mouth from former students. Authorities in Maine reportedly visited the school upwards of 12 times to investigate, however returned with absolutely nothing to show for it. Frustratingly, the operation that Joe Ritchie was running was completely and entirely legal. There were no laws in place for facilities like this, so it was allowed to remain in operation without issue. As we touched on, the media was the primary in for outsiders the in the line. However, even they failed to communicate Chaco. the extent of their operations. While they showed select parts of it, unfortunately Joe Ritchie was given enough airtime to convince the public and the news crew that it was nothing more than their treatment taking place. By dehumanizing the students, Emphasizing their delinquencies on national television, he was able to use this notoriety to his advantage, ultimately swaying the public opinion into believing that what he was doing was entirely good. On top of the growing number of alumni, though, came an increase in escapees, which only furthered Alon's unwanted infamy. 
Over the years, three students, a 16-year-old unidentified individual, nice. a 15-year-old Brad Glickman, Good work. and a 17-year-old Don Birnbaum would all escape successfully, however would meet wildly differing fates. Oh. For the 16-year-old, it's been reported that he ran over 15 miles through the wilderness in the middle of the night. He was eventually caught by an officer, Max Ashburn, and after hearing the boy's story and observing his physical condition, he helped him return home. What a good guy! For Brad Glickman, he was shot. Oh. In 1990, after escaping Elan's search parties, what? he made his way to a house in a small town. Authorities believed that he had a connection to the girl that lived there. However, the homeowner opened fire, ultimately killing him. What? Uh... What? That's like the most American shit I've ever heard in my life. Uh, this guy must know my daughter. <laughs> like what? Jesus Christ. Thanks you two give subs kill command in the resub Terra in tier one summer. And for Don Burnbaum, How she unlucky. too had escaped the clutches of Elan, eventually finding a trucker named James Cruz who was willing to take her home. A few hours down the road though, Birnbaum would find that Cruz's true intentions weren't quite so virtuous. Oh, Jesus. As it turned out, he sexually assaulted her on the side of the highway before strangling and abandoning her body between routes 26 Holy and 550 fuck. in Pennsylvania. She was discovered by another motorist with a yellow rope tied around her neck and without clothes from the waist down. And from her corpse were tire tracks resembling that of a semi-trailer. Since Birnbaum had crossed state wow. lines, an FBI investigation was commenced for her, and after cross-checking with numerous similar cases that have happened in the area, the truck belonging to James Cruz was deemed as the culprit. Upon catching up to him and searching his vehicle, authorities were able to find but a single blonde hair that belonged to Birnbaum, effectively leading to his arrest. That's incredible detective work. Much like, just think about that for a second. This is in the middle of fucking nowhere. Random trucker picks up a random student, well, student's the wrong word, random person from a, a cult, and they somehow tracked it down to the right guy who did it. That is incredible. incredible? Just the detective work here. There's a tier one pack in the resub juke in the prime scary man in the resub genius in virgin shadow. What? A cult in a boarding school? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is pretty wild. What are you doing? What do you think I'm doing? Just watching One Piece. Okay, well, have fun. I'm not even playing any games right now. <laughs> well, that's fine. Just yeah, you're in a good arc. You're having fun. It's a really good arc. It really is. Thanks to the resub side, Jellyfish. Hi, chat. I'm seeing all the hellos, but I can't read too much past that because my glasses are not on. Anyways, I'm gonna go back to that. Okay, well, have fun. Much to the school's displeasure, these cases successfully gained ample attention. Joe Ritchie resultingly paid off numerous judges and journalists in hopes of drowning out the negative press. Thanks for prime proximity. However, outsiders were beginning to catch on that these students were running for a reason. Quick text message. But why? There we go. Okay. All good. Thanks the resub adventure creature mumbling hot in the October prime 30th, 1975, a 15-year-old girl named Martha Moxley was out with her friends participating in what they call mischief night. This typically involved TPing houses, ding-dong kitchens, typical teenager antics. Later that night, <clears throat> Moxley found a liking to a Thomas Skakel, eventually kissing him before the pair decided to venture off. To the other friends in their group, seeing Moxley fall over the Skakel's backyard fence with Thomas was the very last time that they would ever see her alive. The next morning, the Moxley family awakens as usual. They go about their morning routine, however notice that Martha is missing. Upon searching the house for her, 
they notice a body lying by the tree out in the backyard. And they don't really have one stoner boner. And discover a grim scene. Martha is lying, lifeless with her pants down. Her body appears to have been visibly beaten. And a few feet away from the body, broken remnants of a six iron golf club. Holy this shit. This club was eventually traced back to the Skakel family. Autopsy reports claimed that she was bludgeoned and stabbed to death, all by that six iron. And since Thomas Gakel was the last person she was spotted with that night, he was the prime suspect in her murder. Due to a lack of sufficient evidence, however, he, among the other suspects, were eventually absolved. What? And as a result, the Moxley case, frustratingly, went cold. I think it's your one Rowie and Theresa Bryan. Three years later. Thomas's 18-year-old brother named Michael Skakel is arrested for drunk driving. What a great His family all around. Admission to Elan. While there, Skakel was known to be problematic and outspoken. According to Elan students at the time, he would regularly boast about a girl named Martha and how he sexually assaulted and killed her. One student named Gregory Coleman What a weird thing to brag family, about. Recounting how Michael had gone on record to state that I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. The Kennedy reference was alluding to his relation to Robert F. Kennedy. What? Something that would prove pivotal in what? launching his eventual trial to the national spotlight. At the time of his confession, though, nobody could do anything about it. Given the overbearing nature of the rules set at school, any student that tried to tell someone about this was quickly reprimanded. It would take an entire 22 years before Skakel's actions would reach the public eye. In January of 2000, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Martha Moxley. And due to his relation to the Kennedys, it was a case that commanded the airwaves. Since Skakel's primary vehicle of bragging about his crimes was Elan, this, by proxy, had also thrust the school into the national spotlight. Thanks, Arisa. Dozens Virtue. of students took the stand, exposing the callousness <clears throat> that occurred there. The humiliation, the general meetings, the beatings, the ring, the deaths, all of it was brought into the public eye. Realizing this, Joe Ritchie did everything he possibly could to keep discussion about his operation to a minimum. He looks like Neil Breen. He eventually took the stand, downplaying any mention of Elan, touting its high success rate, and doing Here's everything he doink. possibly could to divert the attention back to Skakel and, hope you like God's and Skakel creamy. only. But this was only marginally effective, as this was in the 2000s. An interconnected era of information, catalyzed by a little something called the internet. That piece of shit, huh? Michael Skakel was eventually found guilty of the murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. After serving just 11 years behind bars, he was granted a new trial in 2013, in which he was let go after posting a $1.2 million bond. Oh, Jesus. Today, he walks a free man. But, I do tier one sarcastic, the and there's some Phil Swift and The stick. inhumanities committed at the Elan School were documented in one of the most high profile cases in decades. And because of this, people began talking, theorizing, and investigating, effectively marking the beginning of the end of Joe Ritchie's iron grip on the hundreds of students that were helpless beneath him. Thanks to resub Nathan in the prime green gorilla and two gifts of sarcastic. But with his weakening grasp on the media surrounding his operation came a different hurdle that Joe Ritchie would soon have to overcome. In June of 2000, he was diagnosed with lung cancer caused by his well-known addiction to cigarettes. And just six months later, on the 29th of January 2001, Joe Ritchie would pass away in Portland, Maine at 54 years old. As a result, his second wife, Sharon Terry, would take over operations at Elan. It was clear, though, that due to the increased publicity among the rising alumni testimonies, the idea of Terry having a lot of PR work on her plate was putting it lightly. Throughout the years, 
Numerous changes would be put in place in response to outs- Hold on, someone just said something. Skakel is in jail, by the way. His conviction got reinstated in 2016. Thanks to some Monty, Geo expert in chasing bubbles. Well, this video is brand new and he said that he's a free man. Let me see. Let's take a peek. I don't see anything about him going back to jail. Yeah, there's nothing about him going back to jail. Literally nothing. It got reinstated, just exonerated in 2020. Oh. Not sure, sarcastic. Things you tier one dub nuggets. Check the wiki. Check the what? Fuck the fucking Skakel wiki. What are you talking about, man? What 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 wiki? October 30th, 2020. Michael Skakel won't fit. Oh my god. I hate when the fucking I hate modern journalism where you have to turn off ad block. Yeah, I don't see anything about him going back to jail. I see what you're talking about in 2016, though, where they reinstated the murder conviction, but then in 2018, it seems they vacated it. It's on criticism of the Alon School. In Granny. For instance, the ring was eventually forbidden from being used as punishment. And while this was substantially a good thing, the other cruelties would remain. What Sharon Terry was unaware of, though, was that due to the rapid rise in technology, namely the internet, even her reign over Elan would soon meet its demise. When the water settled following the Skakel case, mentions of Elan were made on various forums throughout the next few years. They would get people talking However, it wasn't quite enough for definite action. By 2010 though, something would change. A website that we all know very well would help spearhead one of the most effective exposed stories in the history of the internet. I want to take a guess. I don't know the story, but I want to guess. Is it something awful? Something awful used to be pretty powerful. No way, is it Reddit? God damn it. That website Fuck. was Reddit. Son of a bitch! On November 26th, 2010, a man named Jeff W., who went by Gazaz My Hero, would make a post titled, Even skimming this once will blow your mind. Most probably think it's made up, but you'd be dead wrong. Within it, he explains that he was an Elan student in 1998, before outlining, in detail, the reality of what took place there. They're mostly points that we've already covered and explored in great detail tonight. But back then, these claims were unbelievable. The school was very much still in operation, so some initially had a tough time <clears throat> wrapping their head around the fact that a place like this actually existed. But then came the comments. The other stories from other alumni with their own experiences. Gazaz My Hero's post carried weight. It was real. And these atrocities the resub, needed the to be tier known. One Dewey knows and two gifts of Zugi. Eventually, this thread would rack up over 2,000 likes and 1.4 thousand comments. While <clears throat> this may not have caused Alon's closure outright, 
it aggressively reopened old wounds. 2010 was not 2000. The internet user base was exponentially larger than it had been, and resultingly, the effectiveness of this newfound attention caused a massive amount of backlash that the Elan School had never before experienced. These three sub chimeras. Four months later. On the 23rd of March, 2011, the Elan School announced that it would soon be shutting down. Sharon and Terry blamed the call on what they deemed to be libelous remarks made about them online. The school has been the target of harsh and false attacks spread over the internet with the avowed purpose of forcing the school to close. The school, unfortunately, has been unable to survive the damage. Shucks. And on the 1st of April, 2011, the Elan School would close its doors. For what a great time. date to close on, on fucking April Officially, Fool's Day. They blamed it on declining student numbers in hopes of diverting the attention away from the actual cause. But on the outside, everyone knew the real reason. For students, this was unbelievably good news. However, the damage they endured was something that would remain. Thanks to the prime bands and sutrus and the resub, Wilhelm, it's been Gigan, that and Kolthog. Numerous Coltog. suicides have occurred as a result of attendance at Elan. PTSD with alumni is rampant, and it's clear that the school had done nothing but damage people. A filmmaker and former student named Todd Nilsson, creator of a fantastic Elan documentary named The Last Stop, has gone on record to state that, as a student, he was helped by their unconventional tactics, but he knew the majority of others weren't quite so lucky. Today, hundreds of stories remain online about the cruelty committed at the Elan School, about the facade they upkept for 41 years. Reading through these are eye-opening, and you can find them on nearly every piece of media and documentation that exists about Elan online. To all of you that have shared employees. your stories, that have opened Sutrus, up about the torment you went I through. Carry the Your voice is literally. the reason that Elan ceases to exist today. This video would not exist without you, and I wish I could say that I feel your pain. But I don't. What's Sharon Terry up to? Let me take a peek. Sharon Terry, what's going on? Wow, since 2011 she has vanished. Holy fuck. Her spirit was trapped in Elan and when it closed down she just ceased to exist. Holy fuck. Yeah, I cannot find anything of Sharon Terry after 2011. My god. Well, thanks to the resub. Physics. While there are and have been other facilities like this throughout history, those are another story for another time. The legacy that Alon left behind is a dark one. Knowing the true history of what occurred off Number 5 Road is haunting, and no matter if it forever stands physically, the psychological destruction that it left behind will very unfortunately forever remain. Hey, the resub bloviator. That was good. That was a very interesting story. God damn, that was fucking intense. So I imagine over the course of 41 years, they must have had a lot of students graduate. And I'm really surprised that it took Reddit to be the one to finally shut that shit down. From one post. Thanks <laughs> to the resub wingman and eat on him. The graduates were brainwashed. That's true. I guess it's hard to really understand that perspective since I obviously wasn't there for the brainwashing.
That was really good, though.